Thank you. As, as we're loading up here, um, I agree with everything our prior speakers said, but if you don't remember anything, there are two drive home points. The first is get screened. I don't care how, but get screened. I'm a colorectal surgeon. I take out a lot of colon cancers and rectal cancers. If I never operated on a patient for colon or rectal cancer again, that would be just fine with me. The second point I want to really emphasize is what Dr. Smith said. Know your family history. I cannot tell you the number of patients I see who showed up at age 50 and had their screening colonoscopy, and of course they had their cancer, but when you talk to them and you go through their family history and you find out that grandma had the colon cancer, oh yeah, not the grandma, but um, uh, a cousin or something. So knowing your family history completely saves lives, as does screening. And as long as we were getting personal, I turned 50 this year, and you can bet I signed up and I got screened, okay? I practice what I preach. So um, some of this you've already heard this morning, and so I'll be um, quick. So this is, this is the organ of interest that we're talking about. Your colon starts over your right hip, kind of goes up, cross, down, and out, uh, makes it sort of an upside down U. Right about here, we transition from the um, colon, and we talk about the rectum. We've been lumping colon cancer and rectal cancer together, colorectal cancer. It is very, very important if you or anyone you um, know does get diagnosed with a rectal cancer. Rectal cancer is a different breed, and, diff and I'll talk a little bit about that as I go through, but that's where we truly make a distinction between colon cancer and rectal cancer. The job of the colon is pretty simple, it just absorbs fluids and electrolytes. When the stool enters from the small intestine to uh, the cecum, that area, it's, um, it's liquid, and the colon absorbs all that water such that when it gets to the rectum, it is solid. And the job of the rectum is really nothing more than to um, store that stool until we're ready to pass it. And at the very, very end, we have uh, the sphincter mechanism that keeps us continent. You've already heard some of these, this data, so I won't uh, belabor it, that um, colorectal cancer is the third leading cause of, uh, the third most common cancer, as well as uh, the third cause of, leading cause of uh, cancer deaths in both um, men and women. We'll touch a little bit on the, uh, the risk factors. The one I will completely you know, belabor is family history, family history, family history. Um, that increases uh, your risk, as we heard, by as much as 25% um, in the general po over the general population. Some of the other conditions which actually weren't touched on is something called inflammatory bowel diseases. You may have heard of something called ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease or Crohn's colitis. Uh, patients with these disease um, do have a small but increased risk of developing colon cancer, increased over the general population. And this is another patient population that we um, ask them to get screened for their colon cancer at a, a more frequent interval than that every five or ten years that you just heard. Touched on a little bit, and I won't go over it again, the, uh, the issues with respect to the diet and smoking and alcohol. So pause a little bit because I think, again, this is very important to really have a good understanding of what some of the signs and symptoms of um, colon and rectal cancer are. Certainly blood noted with bowel movements, and this is usually painless, painless rectal bleeding. Pain with bowel movements when you're at NC blood is actually more of an indication of a benign cause of um, disease. And again, you've heard a little bit about the change in your bowel habits and a persistent change. It's not like you said, you ran out and you know, uh, had some bad Chinese food. A persistent change in your bowel habits, whether it be shifting to constipation or loose stools. An unexplained or unexpected weight loss, not someone who's been at the gym and losing weight. This is someone who just all of a sudden no notices they're dropping weight without any good um, answer for that. Pain, whether it be in the belly, down low in the pelvis, or um, rectal pain. And that's not pain with bowel movements, just kind of a persistent pain in the rectum in that area. Your doctor uh, may find that you may be anemic, but you may find as a sign of that anemia, fatigue. You're just not doing what you used to be able to do. You know, at work, you're getting uh, tired earlier than uh, you, you used to, or going through the day. Shift a little bit now to surgery. That's why they asked me to talk. But it's very important to understand that once diagnosed with colon cancer, it's not just the surgeon that you're going to be um, interacting with. The best outcomes are when we work as a team. And often you'll be meeting not only your surgeon, you will be, and as we'll hear a little bit later from um, Dr. Cohen, your medical oncologist, your radiation oncologist, and some ancillary people as well, your gastroenterologist, radiologist, you know, the Dr. McCarries of the world, and a lot of um, ancillary support services. Cancer is not just a surgical disease. 
anymore. Although interesting, when I went into, as an aside, when I actually chose colorectal surgery and colon cancer, um, really not that long ago, we had very little additional treatment other than surgery for colon cancer. Sort of what made it exciting for me at the time, but now we've let our medical oncologists and radiation oncologists, all with better outcomes. So how do we treat colorectal cancer? really depends on the stage. One thing that we all know is that the um, more advanced the colon cancer or rectal cancer is, the higher chance of being successfully treated, which again says go get your screening test because we'll catch things or even prevent these cancers early. Treatment also depends on where this is. I mentioned earlier whether we're in the colon or the rectum, uh, the different kinds of approaches. And then more than one treatment modality may be used. It's not just surgery. However, for early stage disease, whether, whether in the colon or the rectum, surgery is generally the mainstay of treatment. The more advanced disease we get in the colon, chemotherapy comes into play. And then when we talk about advanced disease in the rectum, radiation comes into play. So early disease, whether you're colon in the rectum, is really just surgery. Chemotherapy gets added in the colon, and chemotherapy and radiation in the rectum. There, there's, there's little to no role for radiation um, as a rule when we treat um, colon cancer. So there are a couple things I'm going to um, talk about uh, with respect to surgery for colorectal cancer. What do we want to achieve? What are our, our goals of op the operation? What operation are you going to have? Because not all operations are identical. Will it this is a very common question, and I'll address this. Once people know what, that they have colon cancer and they need an operation for it, they move straight to, will I need a colostomy or, or a colostomy bag? How is the operation going to be technically performed? Um, is it going to be the traditional what we call open surgery? Or you've been heard a lot about minimally invasive surgery. What are the risks of the surgery that I'm going to undertake? What about recovery? How long am I going to be in the hospital? And how, when, when can I get back to my regular life? And are, is there going to be any additional treatment following surgery? So we'll start with the goals of the surgery. We want to cure people. And in order, in order to have the single best shot of curing patients of their cancer, the goal of my, my job at the operating uh, table is to remove the colon cancer, the, what we call the primary tumors, and as you saw from um, Dr. White's talk, sometimes this tumor, the uh, cancer uh, spreads to the lymph nodes. Part of the operation is removing all of the lymph nodes that can potentially drain or uh, where that tumor can spread to. Sometimes we know we can't cure people. It's just too advanced, but we, these patients still do need surgery. And the goal of surgery here is to make them feel better, essentially. So if they are, do have an obstruction or bleeding or pain, the goal of surgery would be to eliminate or minimize the symptoms that they're having from the cancer. But whether you're operating or I'm operating to cure somebody or to make them feel better, palliation, the goal is always to preserve quality of life. So what operation are we going to do? Simplistically speaking, and I'll have, have a picture in a second, uh, so when we move the um, uh, colon cancer, we are moving part of the colon. We call that a partial colectomy. When we're operating the rectum, we're going to remove part of the rectum. And um, for the most part, we've gotten very good at preserving that sphincter and not having patients require a permanent colostomy. But there's still a small percentage of patients who will need a colostomy. So again, here's that uh, schematic of the colon. The colon is really nothing more than a hollow pipe, as I said, where, you know, uh, or, or a pipe where the fluid goes through. If that's your tumor, we simply just cut above and below it, remove that part, and bring these two ends together. And so I'm just a fancy plumber. Okay. And then same thing on the left side. You got your tumor there. Cut above and below, remove that, and bring, bring your two ends together. Rectum is really a little bit different, okay, the very tail end. It's actually only about 15 centimeters, which really isn't very long. So from the outside world to about 15 centimeters is the rectum. That small organ we actually divide into thirds, the upper third, the middle, and then the lower. Because that treatment is different in the upper and the mid versus the lower with respect to surgery. If you have a tumor in the upper or the mid rectum, um, it's for the most part, I can avoid 
sacrificing these muscles, which is the sphincter muscles. And I just, as we saw in the, um, for the colon, I can cut a little bit above, a little below, and that's about all the room I need to work to, to bring patients back together without a permanent colostomy. So this is where it gets a little um, tricky and patients do require, or often will require, a permanent colostomy. So just take a step back. Colon surgery, as a rule, no colostomy required. When we're operating down here, even if we were in the upper and middle third of the rectum and I have a little room to work, doctors and surgeons such as myself will be put you back together. This area has to heal uh, and it can take some time. So often with this operation for cancers in the upper or middle third of the rectum, following surgery you'll end up with a temporary, temporary colostomy bag or actually an ileostomy. However, when the tumor is in this lower third of the rectum, and it's too close to the muscles, again, our goal is to cure you. And in order to cure you, um, or cure the patient, we need to sacrifice these muscles. And without these muscles, we can't maintain uh, continence, so we end up with a permanent colostomy muscle. Let's get to how we do it, the traditional open surgery versus minimally invasive surgery. You've probably heard of Band-Aid surgery, laparoscopic, and of late, we now even have robots in our operating room. So from a patient standpoint, this is uh, the big difference in uh, laparoscopic or minimally invasive versus open. Open is done through an incision. Through that incision, we gain access to the abdomen and pelvis to do what we need to do. Through minimally invasive surgery, whether it be laparoscopic or um, through the robot, we make these very small incisions, and this is only two of them, but sometimes we have like four or five of these tiny little incisions through which we put instruments and we operate looking at a TV camera. Most, most of these minimally invasive surgeries require a very small incision because we still have to get the colon with the tumor out and we're not gonna get it out through one of these dime size incisions. So, and this is just a, this is a real picture of laparoscopic surgery. These are the ports. So as you can see, this, we have four here and we put our operating instruments through those four ports. This is one of our own, Dr. Elliot Newman, um, surgical oncologist operating. And it's fascinating when I first started doing minimally invasive surgery uh, for colons, we're watching the TV monitor. We're not actually looking at what's going on over here. And this is sort of what we're seeing. We're actually watching TV or the TV monitor as we use our uh, minimally invasive instruments to do what it is we need to do. And this is the... Uh, well, this is the robot, uh, called the Da Vinci robot. And what is even more fascinating to me now, this is the actual robot. These are assistants putting in the instruments through the arms of the robot. The, the, the um, assistants can watch TV, but that's the surgeon. The surgeon is looking through this consult and with his fingers and his feet. It's like, a, it's, it's like an airplane, you know, a uh, cockpit. Got all these um, um, instruments that your, your fingers are on and your, feet, your foot pedals. He, the surgeon here, is actually controlling the arms there and um, doing the surgery. So what are the benefits of minimally invasive surgery? Clearly you saw from that uh, cartoon, certainly smaller incisions. Smaller incisions definitely translate to less pain. People are in the hospital, by, um, a, they get out of the hospital about a day earlier uh, with minimally invasive surgery. But the big boost is that patients return to their normal activity of li the daily activities of life a lot quicker with minimally, minimally invasive surgery than the traditional open surgery. But this is the key point. At the end of the day, we want to cure people. We want to make sure that you know, we still are doing a Cadillac operation. And now there's been enough uh, data in the literature that shows that from an oncologic or cancer standpoint, um, the outcomes are pretty similar between open and uh, minimally invasive surgery. So you've had your surgery, what can go wrong? Hopefully nothing. Hopefully you get out in two or three days and you're, you're home uh, recovering. But you know, um, surgery is a stress on the heart. Heart attacks can happen, okay? People are, are not in, um, up and about and walking, so you don't take deep breaths, pneumonias, infections, bleeding. 
This is the thing that we as bowel surgeons worry about. After we kind of hook you together, we do that welding, in about 2% of the time, that welding springs, springs a leak. And that's a problem, so we don't talk about it much. But that's something that you need to know if it happens. You've had your surgery. What can you expect to get out, out of, um, uh, how quickly can you expect to get out of the hospital? In, I, when I first started, and I'm not that old, you heard I'm 50, so I've been you know, practicing for 16 years. It was not uncommon for patients to be in the hospital seven to 10 days and up to two weeks. This is pretty much the norm now, three to five days. And that's actually in, even in open surgery. My patients who have open surgery are pretty much are going home four to five days um, in. And then the recovery, how, it's really mostly a stamina thing, how long it takes you for, to feel 100%. It really depends on whether you've had the minimally invasive surgery up to um, the open surgery. I saw a guy uh, who I did a minimally invasive uh, procedure on, and I usually see my patients two weeks following surgery. He went home on day three. How are we doing? Great, I went skiing last weekend. This guy 10 days out of surgery was skiing. So uh, those, these people definitely do recover a little bit quicker. What about long term? They really, even though we take out you know, big chunks of the colon, from a bowel function standpoint, certainly within the colon, um, bowel function is largely unchanged. There are some issues when we do take out the rectum. But when we are um, operating in the pelvis, uh, it's a very tight, narrow space, and the nerves that um, control some sexual function and the bladder are kind of intimately um, involved with the rectum. And it's not, well, it's become a lot less common. About 3% of patients will have some sexual and uh, bladder dysfunction following deep pelvic surgery, those low rectal cancers. So what are the take home messages other than get screened and know your family history? It's, common, it's a common disease that's both preventable by screening. Caught early, it's curable. It's not just about me, the surgeon, anymore. We have a whole team. A whole team is that going to help uh, patients with colon or mental cancer. And it's important to seek out experienced teams that do this on a regular basis, because that's clearly been shown where patients have the best outcomes. Thank you.